the title of the talk, um, Brains, Minds, uh, and Institutions, and that, and that sort of evokes a trinity. Uh, you might uh, detect there uh, the influence of the uh, eminent uh, philosopher uh, Karl Popper, who believed that the world can be divided into three parts. Um, the first part uh, is the material world. Uh, it's uh, the, the world of physical and chemical entities and, and processes, and this would include uh, clouds and clocks, it includes rocks and trees, it includes the moon uh, and light reflected off of water. The second part, world two, is made up of our mental states. The way that we feel, the way that we represent the world uh, in our own conscious minds. Uh, and these uh, states are real because they interact with our bodies. Um, a toothache is a, is a mental state. Uh, as is a, a drug-induced high. Uh, depression and anxiety are mental states. They have physical and chemical bases, but they're experienced as mental states. And then Popper suggested that there's a third world, world three, which is composed of the material products of the human mind. Uh, this includes stories, myths, tools, theories, social institutions, works of art. According to Popper, a book is a physical object, and therefore it belongs to world one. But what makes it a significant product of the human mind is its content, that which remains invariant across different copies and editions. And of course, these three worlds connect and interact. Uh, world three depends on world two. World two depends on world one. Reductionism uh, is the belief that the causal arrow always goes from world three to two to one. That is to say that what happens at the level of institutions can be understood uh, in terms of the mental states of the actors that uh, compose them, and these in turn can be understood in terms of deeper physical and chemical processes. The brain, of course, belongs to world one. It is a physical entity. It is an organ. But the brain is also the source of the mind. And one can think of the mind, as Karl Popper did, as the human faculty that allows us to use language to direct the activity of the brain. For example, by writing books, we create world three objects. And these objects then confront us uh, as objective problems, and thereby directing the activity of our brain toward solutions. Brains are, of course, networks of neurons that produce mental activity. By analogy, societies are networks of conscious persons who through communication produce art, culture, institutions, and politics. Another way of saying this is that minds are emergent properties of brains, just as institutions are emergent properties of societies. Emergence contrasts with reductionism. It suggests that world uh, two emerges from world one and world three emerges from world two, but worlds three and two can influence worlds two and one. The critical point is made by Gazzaniga when he says, the mind, which is somehow generated by the physical processes of the brain, constrains the brain. Just as political norms of governance um, emerge from the individuals who give rise to them and ultimately control them. So the mind directs the activity of the brain just as institutions, schools, factories, armies, direct the mental uh, effort of individuals. I'd like to turn to politics and political institutions. In my recent book entitled Strong Constitutions, I argued that political states reflect and replicate individual level mental processes. As Emile Durkheim put it, the state is a thinking organ. States write. Legislators hold pens that bring laws into effect. States read. Judges are the mouths that pronounce the words of the law. Legislatures and courts are the deliberative organs of the state. They ensure the use of coercion enjoys the legitimacy that is conferred by legality. The process by which states emerged with this sort of complex division of powers was a complex one, and it involved changes in social organization, communication, and cognition. The first watershed was the invention of literacy, the spread of reading and writing led to the first conscious theorizing about politics. And Aristotle's work, and here you see him looking at Homer, marks the shift from the oral world to our literate world. The 
printing press was another major watershed. As printed materials spread, more people could read and write, and people realized that societies were not just products of nature, but rather they could be created and transformed through literary effort, effort for example, by writing constitutions. And I think today we're living through yet another watershed, an electronic revolution, the telegraph, the radio, a telephone, a film, computers, cell phones, have given rise to what Marshall McLuhan called a global village. The problem is that our worlds two and three have made us so powerful that we're now transforming world one in ways that threaten our very survival. Our impact on the natural world is so great that we're causing the mass extinction of other species, the loss of biodiversity, the destruction of entire ecosystems, and climate change that threatens the very atmosphere upon which we depend for our own lives. For humanity to survive and flourish, we need to build the kinds of institutions that can direct our collective efforts at restoring a balance with the natural world. Our brains are the most powerful force on Earth. What can restrain such force? only, I believe, its own products. Our best hope for learning to live well with one another and in harmony with nature lies in the possibility of generating world three products of mind that pose to us problems in such a way as to enhance our ability to put our minds to the great collective problems that we face. Thank you very much.